So it was my great pleasure, we will continue the 14 Ukraine Algebra Conference. And our next speaker today, Professor Mikhail Gromov from Current Institute of Mathematical Sciences, uh, who will tell us about as a parameter of group algebras. So, so the geometric picture, which gives the idea of isoperimetric. And uh, this is probably the oldest, one of the oldest geometric theorems that circle surround the maximal possible volume per given length. And the same is true in all dimensions, which is nowadays looks, seems rather obvious, but still it is not kind of, in, in certain specific sense, it's unknown if there is elementary proof of this. Just for the, for, for the record, there are elementary proofs in dimension two and four. You can prove it in certain way just by language without making some argument, limits, transformation, whatever, just writing a formula. But there is no such proof in any other dimension, so it's not completely trivial. I just, this is just preliminary. I just want to say that this is a kind of really you know, non-trivial theorem, and uh, it is a, it has uh, even more remarkable development due to Arngren, which we don't know how to algebraize, make it algebraic, yeah, at all. It is highly non-elementary in a technical sense, not it's first difficult, but also it's non-elementary in logical sense. In dimension two, it is kind of elementary, yeah. And, um, and the point is we want to extend it as much as possible to linearize it. So that's the principle. And we have to make a setting which will be rather discrete. And then we try to uh, explain how to linearize it and tell you what is known about it, right? This is, this is uh, the logic. And so we shall be dealing with discrete sets and everything is written here, so all notations, so I don't have to repeat them, but still they're there. Hopefully they're more or less correctly written. So we have, you, but you, in order to have this concept of isoperimetric, you need, on your object, you need two entities. You have to measure their size, and this measure must be really measured, something like measure, which something sometimes at least you can add, right? Say diameter is a not good thing, yeah, or distance. It does like to add in, a, in space. You have to force it, to, normally it doesn't, right? So in a way, Pythagorean theorem allows to add them in a Hilbert space as efficiently. And secondly, you need concepts of a boundary. So you need concept who is close to you, who is inside, outside, and boundary, which is points are close to, you both to inside and to outside, right? So this is you need, and a good setting when you have a discrete set, action of a finite group, oh, I'm sorry, action of a group, or even of an individual element, not at all finite, and you see how it acts on finite subsets. And so here is a definition, you transport your set. I prefer our transformation to be invertible, which is not necessary, but it simplifies notations. And then yes, you see how much goes outside when you move it. We can also see what remains inside. There are several concepts of boundaries and they, when you get sharp, sharp results, some have advantages over others, but I will fix, we were dealing only with a single one, which I described here. And so it is kind of quite clear what you do. You have cardinality of a set. You, you move it. Now it may be not one, but several transformations, which is more interesting. And moreover, you assume identity element there. It's again to simplify notations, right? And this typically it will be infinite group and action on it by itself. I hate to say left translation because I don't know how you distinguish left from right. There is no way to do it. And it's, it's a non-mathematical convention. And because you cannot explain mathematically, it for me shades some doubt on any logic because you have to write either from left to right or from right to left. Or, and then you have to say what it is and there is no way to distinguish it yeah? or keep it not immobile. And I think it is a kind of non-trivial issue here. 
arises, but somehow I say this left. So you choose from which side you act, always from one, and you'll be always called left. But this is not a joke. Yeah, I think it is a non trivial issue. And, um, and then, is, so this is your isometric profile. It just tells by how much they move, and you take, and you want to know that if you have it now returning to this geometric picture, you can say, you want to see sets which per given boundary have maximum size, volume, or cardinality. And and the and this function depends on one from another. That's saying the boundary must necessarily be larger than this optimal one is your set theoretic isometric profile. Set theoretic because in a, in a few minutes we shall turn to linear algebra and then we'll be its companion on in vector spaces and one of the perspectives you may have that this function tell if you think about this action on the set that's like dynamical system and this asymmetric profile tells you how far points move with respect to this kind of natural metric saying the two sets are close if they say symmetric difference is close to the volume so oscillatory difference is small so so we just kind of and the uh, and big and big in the limit you have fixed or almost fixed points so it's about maybe expressing this language but for the moment at this stage we don't need it and this is combinatorial as a profile and then we want to evaluate it in specific situations. As I said, in the Euclidean space, you know, it is a different setting. It's not discrete. And uh, transformation must be careful. So how you understand boundary, but in the usual, in the usual terms, you know what it is. Circle is extreme. Yeah. It has yeah. contained maximum area per given, per given space. And now, just before I go into before I go into um, next level, I just cannot resist saying that there is a much more profound phenomenon in nature and discovered, which was identified by, kind of, it was discovered by nature well, roughly, I think, three billion years ago, maybe more. Namely, this is a small viruses which solve different problems. Say like drops of water, physics, are rather simple-minded science, nature, non-organic nature, simple. You have a drop of water in their balls, and they indeed, up to some extent, have minimal, tend to have minimal area per given volume. But viruses are not like that. You see, viruses have icosahedral symmetry, and not all around. And which problem they solve? And they solve, it's not volume which they contain per given size of the boundary but maximal information or, or, or maximal kind of a library per given information which this library contains so their boundary is what's written in the book and what inside the books themselves and the point with viruses their books bigger than the information they contain because so this chemistry amino acids are smaller than bases bases yeah and then optimal solution might be cathedral and this was explained, this idea was due to Watson, who prior to this DNA, famous work on DNA, made this guess, when the virus, of course, rengenoscopy was way highly undeveloped, but he made this guess and happened to be right. And this, I think, is one of the most brilliant ideas in science ever. And a mathematician fully unaware of that, and it's really it's highly kind of amazing mathematics which may arise from here, right? Yes, think about that. Yeah, you don't contain volume of information versus sub background on which is information is written, and this I think is absolutely fascinating, both from point of view of logic and mathematics, and the fact that it's possible to do that. And then it's, of course, no mathematical results known in this regard. Yeah, except that for viruses, found a cathedral solution. But now we turn to something more mundane matters, and. And yeah, by the way, this concept for groups was uh, introduced by Vershik in, in, in his paper in 82, but this was much earlier 
definitely I, 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 he spoke about that before 74, before I left Russia. So it was probably 70s at least he had this idea that's an interesting invariant. And in the second we see it has some parallel with the growth of groups. And Versi thought about that and kind of and, and, and motivated by concepts of amenable group to which I, I, I will come in, in a few minutes. And now what we have instead of, so in my first setting, group X equal to discrete set. And the major example was a group X equal to itself by left say translations. And <clears throat> of course, by the way, you can think what about a group X equal to by conjugation. It will be a different story. And I don't think we understand it that well. And then we have this linear action and the basic action we shall be having in mind is action of, of the function on the space of function on this function, on this group. So I have a group, there are elements, function on this group with value in some field and the, for different fields answer may be a priori different, which we don't know. And we see how it acts, you know, it's a regular representation, but in algebra emphasis is when your function have all, all of them have finite support. So just like there we had finite sets and so this will be, and then we see how it acts on linear spaces of functions with fixed support. So we can see the only linear spaces which have support in a given set. And then my, my, the set may grow and you want to understand what happens. And so, so everything I said now it applies in the same way. You only change notation. You, you, you have to define boundaries slightly differently, right? So this, this replaces the difference. This is the boundary. And and then it, it's a rank of that is so, so it's the same. Yeah, you see how linear space move and see how much it goes outside. What we mean outside for linear spaces? You just compare the ranks, you take intersection and just subtract from what remains. And of course, yeah, so we, you, we, we, we slightly, of course, because you have formally speaking, you take quotient spaces to, to, say, to, to make it smoother. And is, again, we ask the same question, what will be the optimal? Now, instead of looking only on sets, we can see the also on functions. So we can see the more objects, space became bigger. Instead of sets, instead of set, we can see the all five dimensional linear spaces on the set. And, and still ask the same question. If, what is the optimal inequality? It tells you if the boundary is small, the set is small, or in other way around, if you have a big set, big linear space, its boundary will be big, and what is the estimate? So clearly the function must become bigger, right? Inequality must become only weaker, right? Because we enlarge the space where the group X. So we have a, the same. It's easy to say it this in this way we extend our so to speak measure on sets to measure on linear spaces, right? Because dimension of a space function like you find a dimensional set equal cardinality of the set, right? It's kind of trivial, but then we have it. And group algebra is another way to say it that you have now we can in some way we can don't think in, in in group theoretic terms, but say we have a group algebra and and this group this algebra acts on itself by by my left multiplication. So so far I think it's clear what I say. Yeah. So if nothing is said, presumed to must be very simple to absorb at this stage. On the other hand, of course, definition. If you don't, never heard them, you have to have some feeling for what is in a, in a minute there will be some examples and so there are some little kind of terminology what is support of a linear space or function it is set so so everything outside of this is zero of course it's not it maybe may, may have may, you may have big set you only one function equal being constant on this set, so it's only one function with this support or the set or you can consider all functions with this support and so there is rank or dimension will be equal to the cardinality of the set, but they have very different forms. And so, so the first kind of point here is the first theorem is uh, that the question which you ask, if the two things are equal, 
Now, so we have this inequality, and you want to know if there is sometimes equality. So if you have so the extremal problem, when you solve the extremal problem in a bigger space, so you, you look for the maximal linear space contained with a given boundary, solution will be what we had before. It will be just assessed, meaning in, 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 in slightly different terms. If you think about linear space and a function is a space with coordinates, you actually like Euclidean space with a given coordinates. And then subspaces will be the coordinate subspaces, just product of lines in all directions. The number of them will be just uh, reasonably small. And but extremal solution will be one of those, which is not terribly surprising. But however, sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not true. And so sometimes it's not true. There are finitely generate infinite groups where these two functions have nothing in common. One is very small, another is very big. However, and this is a first theorem, is that if the group is left orderable, meaning it is admits order invariant on the left translation or right translation, which I mean it's the same for, for all, just depending how you look at it, then the two functions are equal. The one de defined in, in the category of sets and another in the category of linear linear spaces. And this is kind of uh, actually, I, I would never uh, kind of guess that, but I spoke to Dima Grigoriev to school in a different context, ex explain, me, explain what is a group on the basis. And once you understand it, you see that this applies to all groups. Exactly, this more or less is one of the implicit lemmas in the theory of this group on the basis, which is all I know, pretty, well, this is what, what I said. Okay, so, and then there are many groups, for example, all abelian groups, left orderable is this already something and um, important groups and lots of lots of groups which are left orderable and some of them are not and there is actually a reasonable understanding of this which i don't want to go into though it will be appearing now so what i simple yeah in the question which remains is that if the two things, if not equal to more or less the same, at least if, if a group has no torsion. And this is a version of Kaplansky conjecture, which said that, as you know, that group algebra of groups without torsion have no zero devices. So the kind of torsion, you can create torsion by linearity. But this strong statement, in my view, yeah. And so it's less likely to be true. So there must be easier to make count example, but I don't know count example. So I will be formulating several questions on the way because when you go along, very many things remain for me unsolved. And here is some elementary properties of that. And again, that is easy what happens when you take a group and subgroups how be this both of this profile behave in obvious way. If you have smaller, smaller pool of sets, your inequality becomes stronger, which of course needs some argument, right? Because you, but, but, but still, it, because we change the number of trans, trans, translation as well, but essentially this argument. And when you go to quotient groups, it's not so clear. And again, there is a problem that the type where you map the group in which you map must be left orderable. And the same argument by, by Grobner type or Grobner type basis, you can reduce linear algebraic situation to combinatorial one. And again, I, I don't know what happens in general. I don't have counter example to that, which probably there might be counter example, but I'm not, but also of course, heavily depending on torsion. But what is unclear, that now what is clear that you if you change your field but in the same characteristic nothing changes because the problem of linear algebra and every, what is solvable there will be solvable in any field yeah something divisible by p it's an, an immaterial how big the field the field is otherwise but in examples I, I, for what, what available there are limited number of examples so i wouldn't make any guesses these two functions are equal, don't depend on the field. But certainly there must be dependence on the field, especially if there is torsion. 
and characteristic of the field has subject of the distortion. So I would think that it's, there might be significant difference, but, but it's unclear and the proof of, of certain results quite different for, field, for fields of zero characteristic and not. And here is instance of that. This were the first results in this direction. The proven first by Alec for characteristic zero and then Bartholdi. And this concerning amenability. But, but, but so, so what is amenable and unamenable? So in the present context, definition which I take is exactly adapted to, the, to, to everything else. I'm, just, I'm sorry, I have to, my computer connected for some reason, disconnected. Okay, now, the whole story came from von Neumann concept of a minimal group. In a minimal group, a group in the X in some space, you can make averages of the group, like integers. But then Ferner found definition in these terms saying that if this function, isoparametric, is linear, so it meaning it is proportional up to a constant, up to multiplicative constant equal this R. So this, I prefer to have a real number. I'll bet in the examples was always integer, but it's convenient to have it real. As we shall see in, in a second, yeah, because it's convenient to take it half, for example. And, 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 and this definition, unlike definition of these actions, extends to, extends to algebras. Actually, for algebras, amenability essentially means that you can speak reasonably of rank of moduli over, the, over these algebras. Those algebra are infinite dimensional, but there is good concept of, of moduli, amenable algebras, where the responding function there also have linear growth. And this notion, you don't have to be group algebra. Just as I say, my definition is quite general of the profile and makes sense for any algebra. So though, if it's to your transformation from which you start are not invertible, you might be slightly more careful to say what you mean by the boundary, so to have adequate definitions. And, uh, and this is a two groups. So in a second, just to be sure of that. Now, amenable is just, as I said, very remarkable property, in a, which came from dynamic, very special. The groups kind of, if you divide groups into categories, and kind of on, on one end you have Free abelian group in the opposite end, you have just free groups. So amenable kind of generalization of abelian groups and non amenable generalization of free groups. And, 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 and the kind of, and up to some extent, people believe this is some of the same, but now that you know there are many intermediates. However, here is specific conjecture about amenable group. It's a kind of algebraic saying that this is inequality, namely saying that you don't have sets. So, so it's better to say what is non-amenable. Non-amenable, it means that there are sets where boundary grows with the same rate as the volume. No, or rather, the volume doesn't grow faster than the, the boundary. So the, you have the strongest possible inequality. The number of points inside is more or less bounded by the number of points on the boundary. It looks extremely of course, strong property. If you look at, think about balls in the Euclidean space, no, no matter how they grow, of course, interior bigger than boundary. But this because they have a very special set. The moment you take more or less uh, ugly sets, yes, the, the first picture which I, let me return to this picture. You see this, we have, we have very long, long boundary comparing to this, to this interior, of this interior area. So to be amenable, be non-amenable to have this optimal inequality, is not so fantastic as we look. And I, of course, from a certain point of view, you say it's optimal or you can say the worst possible case, because sometimes you do have, you don't want to have the sets which have interior bigger than boundary for purposes of applications. So depending on what you do, what you call optimal. But anyway, this concept amenable, and it's, it's easier to say non-amenable, naming inequality, and, and, and amenable case, 
for all, in all examples of amenable groups, we have either have loss of torsion or loss of commuting elements. And skid is a conjecture. Example which I know, maybe I'm missing some example, that if you consider elements whose powers commute, then the, their number is kind of better than the number in Z, it, it, assuming the group is, is itself not commensurable to Z. In all example, it's, it's kind of a significant number, like Z plus Z. So it may be even gross as degree four. But this is the weakest you can say. So that's the conjecture. Again, I must admit I haven't looked carefully at all conceivable examples with, with certain precision. And and there and there are kind of so-called elementary amenable group, I say in a second what they are. And then Gregory Shuk found non-amenable group, which seems to me satisfies the property. And now they the reconstruction based on descriptive set theory by logic, sort of there are non-elementary, non-amino group about which I have no idea. They and you have studied this paper and it may be implicit the way this group emerges, if it does have commutativity. But the point is, it's very difficult to be amenable and, and, and being infinite at the same time, right? With the moment you start aging relation enough to make it rather condensed, compare very far from free, a little bit more it may become finite. And so, and then you'll be so called pure torsion. On the other hand, generic torsion group or whatever, all kind of groups, any degree of generality are non-immutable. But there is this, I, I don't think we have clear, I, even hypothetical picture, division, where, what a division line between amenable and non-immutable, right? So we, we start from some example here, example there, try to generalize what you know about this example, and probably we are very naive, and the world is much more interesting than that. And here is just this is something about non-amenable group. Ah, what did what I wrote? I'm sorry. Free group are non-amenable. Free abelian groups are amenable, but free groups are non-amenable. I'm sorry. This is this is incorrect. Generic torsional groups are non-amenable. And so this definition of amenable and non-amenable this extends to algebras exactly, and uh, so this means a very special kind of inequality, linear isoprimetric inequality. And, uh, and then there are these two theorems that these concepts are equivalent for groups and for algebras. And this is first Elik proved this for characteristic zero. Actually, he proves for co complex numbers. He proves something stronger for complex numbers, but then follows for uh, characteristic zero. And then Bartholdi gave a different proof apl applicable to all to all fields. And his proof actually uses order, though order is hidden, right? You average over all orders to prove it. It's both proof quite nice, not long, but not kind of not obvious yet, in my view. You have to make some guesses how to do this. Now, there is slightly different perspective on, so I have another 10 minutes, right? Hello, I have yes. to admit, correct, yes. you hear me? Yes, 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 you're right. Okay, just to be, to be sure. And there is another kind of simple quantity and you have heard, heard this talk in the first lecture, the first lecture about algebras and for function is the growth, which just multiplies generating set by itself many times, look at cardinality and how it grows. And this is a function which grows at most exponentially. And if the sub exponentials already have small boundaries in, 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 in this. And then and at this point, where she introduces this Fermat function, which is kind of a tricky. And so to have in mind is in, so you say, you can see that instead of the boundary, you look at the ratio of the volume of the boundary and volume of the interior. And think about this like diameter. For example, we take a ball and its volume grows as one power, boundary grows one power less. So the ratio essentially is the radius, rather the radius or whatever up to a constant or diameter of the ball. And so you see what is, uh, the, the, the maximal volume contained by a set of this given diameter, right? And this is kind of 
instead of volume, say diameter. So, and and this is kind of give you very different perspective. Of course, one function defines another. This Ferlina function carries slightly less information, but essentially they're two the same, and, and they're equal if this one, one of the function is monotone. And, and and the question is, so many results are much, look much more elegant when you formulate in terms of Ferlina functions. So far, I didn't formulate anything except for amenable and amenable case. And, and and in particular, this was conjectured by Versic, but this function may grow much faster, and this happens to be the, the case. And uh, this, and it should be also noted that this this property, both amenable and amenable, or this profile of Versic, the invariance of the group rather than generating system, if you they understood up to obvious equivalence. When you change generators, generators said they changed a little bit by constant or subject of the kind. I'm slightly more careful in what sense, but these they are essentially, essentially like that. And, <clears throat> and this, so this should be done. Now we go to the, other inequalities. So far, we, the only thing we had just the linear inequalities that were equivalent. And now we introduce another way to describe this isoperimic profile at this growth of the ball per given volume, volume understood, a given diameter. Diameter understood as, vol as volume divided by area, volume of the interior, area of the boundary. Of course, volume meaning cardinality, cardinality of interior, Area meaning cardinality of the boundary and the suit with respect to the action of the group. And then it's convenient to have multivariable function because you have several elements in there. And so you do it for each of them. And, and so you say, aha, instead of diameter, you imagine you have a rectangular solid and you measure several dimensions. You move it left, right, ahead, et cetera, and see how much you have to move to get, get out of, it, of itself. And, and then again, you want to know the formula. And then you've come to the following nice inequality, which in a second I discuss it. And it says that if you have free abelian group, then you have such nice formula. This Fernand is a function of uh, NK variables, for the standard generators, just product of these numbers. And this is for combinatorial one. This combinatorial one follows from this inequality. And I say a few words about it in a second. And, and this is exactly proven by ordering argument. But this quite remarkable thing, and it was explained to me at some point by Noga Alon, this in fact special, it's a special case of so-called so shared inequality, which in turn is just formal corollary of the Shannon inequality. And and so it says again that if you, and this is quite easy, you want to, you can read it, it is absorb the statement. If, if, of course, rectangular solid must understand kind of carefully, right? It meaning just product of sets on, on lines. Yeah, they don't have to be connected. If it's connected, then it will be truly solid, but maybe just connected. And, and this is kind of very beautiful, very simple kind of statement and the proof the kind of it's you it's share inequality and the most conceptual visual proof you use the law of large numbers it actually corollary of the law of large numbers and which show that and, and, and many similar things second inequality basic inequality is so long so of course as, as a pinnacle inequality and again it's again take very it has very elegant form yeah you see that this fair function is essentially, it's the same as the growth function. You see, just, right, and so it's convenient to have here, say, n over two, yeah. So you presume that you interpolate, extrapolate this to all values, just to, to make life easier. So it's another, and again, it's quite simple. But there were before some special result by Pansiopolis for important groups. And first one, Pansio proved that and in his thesis, and Almgren, who was kind of the top 
man in Germany, once he heard about that, he was, he was kind of shocked how, you know, you could, a young man could dare to, to make such impossible thing to think about inequality in, in not in the Ukrainian space and to prove something. It was really kind of rather unexpected by, by everybody. But nowadays the proof takes you no know, half a page, very simple, but you have, again, you have to guess. This is a new field and things go. And then in the second inequality, basic inequality is the one concerning the risk products. And these risk products are remarkable operation groups, which I defined here. And uh, it is, there are not so many natural kind of factorial binary operation groups. And these products, one of them are very specific for groups. I don't know if there is something like that in, 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 in many other categories. Actually, for orderable sets, there are good concepts of a counter part of a risk product for orderable. And also for orderable groups, also they behave nicely. And when you, and this is interesting operation because when you iterate it, you have this infinite power and you have interesting logic attached to this. Yeah, it's related to certain hierarchy of, of, of ordinals. But here is again, it's also an equality and also the proof relatively. Relatively short, but again, you have to guess, yeah, which is not, not, doesn't happen often. And then, and, uh, and, and then, yes, to, to, to conclude, so, so this, all of these, what I said, in the case of the group are orderable, you can apply also to algebras. But the question was, if you can do something which is not coming from this theorem, theorem about order, so I know orderable things are equivalent. You have these two basic inequalities. So of course in Erste, which applies to wide class of groups, in many of them are orderable. For example, risk products of orderable groups are orderable. So already starting from, from integers, you have many examples, rather highly elaborate solvable groups. Where this is true. And um, but then there are other examples, and this kind of the, the, the basic example of groups which get out of simple categories, because as, as you know, it was discovered by Grigor Chuk. So somewhere AC, I forgot actually the reference when he was discovered them, and now because we know a big field and there are lots of these groups. And you can apply entropic argument, which I mentioned before, kind of the law of large numbers. Because there is kind of inbuilt kind of dynamics in these groups and, and their properties. And using that, you, you, you have produced these kind of examples. But for, for in general, for non-orderable groups, we don't know if this function may, be, may grow arbitrarily fast. It has some limitation. So if, when you iterate the release product many times, it's fairly a function for groups grows grows and grows, but I'm not certain what happens for this linearized version of it. And, and, and finally, you can turn to analysis and ask, well, we have function on the group with finite support. Now imagine you have a field which has a norm, for example, real numbers or periodic numbers. And you ask what happens to this function when you take even a bigger space. So function, asymptotic function must become kind of less powerful. I will keep forgetting bigger or smaller, but inequality become less, less powerful, but still sometimes may be preserved as we've seen, because very hard to violate as asymptotic inequality. The set which violates might be quite pre pretty bad, but any natural construction doesn't create such, such a bad objects. So we hope it may be true. And so it is unclear. So how much this decay influences the American inequality. If they decay very fast, double exponential, if I'm not mistaken, probably exponential, I'm not certain if it works, the fastest exponential, then it's the same, yeah. Yeah, the proof I have in mind is double exponential. Then the same, whether it's finite support or infinite support. You can always make support. But if it's just decaying, or L2, LP, it's an untrivial question, and, for, and, and there are limited, limited examples. In particular, ELIC proved for L2, for abelian groups, oh, I'm sorry, for, uh, not, not for abelian, for, for amenability versus non-amenability, detected by L2 space and actually for any P, for any LP space essentially by convex argument, and, um, and there are some other examples. And so this is what I am said, it was more or less an introduction to my, from my old paper, 
from which I must admit I forgot most arguments. I still vaguely remember results. And at this I can stop and may try to answer the question if there are some. And I stop sharing, so you see, you see. Okay. Right, my understanding of time is correct, right? Yeah. 